I'm going to be reading to you today from uh, 1 Samuel and uh, chapter 24. Um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about David. Um, but if you haven't read the books of 1 and 2 Samuel, can you please take some time out? Can you just give me that word that you'll go out and you'll read those two books? I mean, there is not a, uh, there is not a series on Netflix, on Hulu, that compares to what happens in these two books of the Bible. I mean, it is juicy. It is incredible. You want some tea? This is where you need to crack the Bible open to, okay? It is good, good reading. And so I'm going to start in chapter 24, and I'll give you a little update in a minute here. But it says, after Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone out into the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to go search for David and his men near the rocks. At the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Now is your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power today to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of, of Saul's robe. When I was first invited to come share with you today, I immediately started asking God what he would have me say. And after some time, I felt God compel me to ask you the same question that he's been asking me as well. And the question is, who are you when Saul is at your mercy? For a long time, God's been asking me that question. Vanessa, who are you when Saul is at your mercy? I'm going to jump into this message, but before I do, I, I have to pause here and acknowledge that we, um, as you just heard, are in the tail end of Black History Month, and it's just an incredible time, and I have a little confession for you. I am not black. I know, I know that comes as a surprise to some of you to look at me here today, but the reason that this month is so important to me is because my life has been so deeply enriched and blessed and impacted and, and, and just deeply, deeply blessed by the black community. And I believe in giving honor where honor is due because I believe that there is enough to go around and we don't have to worry about there not being enough celebration for the rest of us. And so you might be thinking, but Ness, isn't it weird to celebrate just one culture for a whole month? Nah, no, I don't think that's weird. I don't think it's weird at all. You know what's weird? Celebrating single de mile, that's weird. I don't care what color you are. I don't care if you're black, Asian, you're white. You're eating tacos on single de mile. You can eat tacos any time of the year. You know, we don't celebrate that, okay? Only you guys celebrate that. We don't celebrate that. That's weird. That's what I call weird. So I don't think it's weird. And I look back at my life and I see the great many black men and women who taught me about Jesus, who acted like Jesus, who showed me the ways of Jesus, who demonstrated that in my life. And really, I owe a lot to those great men and women. From Dr. Godot, my, my childhood pastor, who's the pastor of Calvary Christian Center right down the freeway here, who literally lifted up my infant body before the Lord and dedicated me to God's work in the presence of my family, in the presence of his church. To Dr. Melvina Jones, uh, my professor at CRC, who, who taught me what it was to be a woman who cared about politics as a believer, as my job, what it is to, to know, to read the news, to understand. To Sister Boomy, my childhood Sunday school teacher who prayed with me to invite God to give me the gift of the Holy Spirit, to taught me what it meant to speak in tongues. To Pastor Lewis, who covered and cared for my family. To the many sisters in our church who would approach my mom and prophesy, God has a calling on your daughter's life. You see, there's been so many great black men and women that God has used. And so I love this month. I love to give honor and credit. Oh, and can we talk about the musicians? 
Can we talk about the praise breaks and the minor chords? Come on, if your life is not blessed by that, I mean, wake up. Listen, today I came to serve a reminder of great critical importance to you. That we, as your theme is this year, become so deeply anchored in truth that we fill our hearts with truth, that we stay close to Jesus, that we get close to Jesus, and that we invite the discernment of the Holy Spirit because we're living in a time where not everything is as it seems. Does anyone agree with that? Not everything is as it seems. What was true today may not be true tomorrow. What was real Yesterday doesn't seem real today. It kind of seems like truth is relative based on, on how you feel on a given day, right? In fact, we're living in a time where the church itself cannot tell the difference between its missions and its threats. We don't know if we're being attacked or if we're supposed to be the kingdom of God. And I sense today that God is sifting his church. He is in search of a pure and a humble bride to come home to. He is sifting us. And as the years and the months go by, you will begin to see great men and women of faith fall down, become exposed. Pastors that you grew up with, leaders that you remember, evangelists that you remember hearing about or seeing, you will begin to see a lot of great men and women become exposed and fall. And that's why truth cannot be relative to our feelings, cannot be relative to our morality. It's got to be anchored in what God has said to us. And, you know, and I really thought I was good. I really thought my walk with God was good. I really, I thought I trusted God until I found myself and what I like to call a situation, right? How many of you have been in a situation before? It's a testing. And I learned that in this situation, we won't really know the truth about ourselves or about our faith until somebody takes it out for a spin. You know what I'm saying? The testing is the moment that we find Saul at our mercy. I want to tell you a story. One year ago today, I found Saul at my mercy. One year ago to the date, in fact, that I am standing before you here right now, I found Saul and my mercy. You see, this time last year, 2020 was already pretty insulting, right? There was no COVID yet, but we had already lost Kobe Bryant. The 49ers lost to the Chiefs. I mean, eh. And I watched my sister-in-law and my brother-in-law hold on to dear life to their 10-year-old son while he took his last breath here on earth after a six-month battle with cancer. This was where I was at this time last year. I was coming off the heels of some deep wounds, only to turn around and face a rather public, deeply humiliating, and totally unexpected parting of ways between myself and another party. You see, I can handle separation. I'm a big girl, like, hey, you don't want to do business together, we're good. Hey, you think we're done? Okay, fine, no problem. I'm a big girl, I can handle that. But this was handled so poorly. This situation was like salt in my wounds. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been in a situation like that? I mean, it was not only directly insulting to me, but to my husband, to my family, to my work ethic to my character, and to my culture. Listen, I'm the type of girl that's like, 
yo, we can handle this. Let's go outside. I'll take my earrings off. I'll put my hair up. We can do this, but leave my family, leave my culture out of this. Anyone know what I'm talking about? We could go rounds. It was raw. It was raw, you guys. And I got the receipts to prove it. You see, David found himself in a situation much like mine, but probably a little worse off, you know? And if you read um, chapter, excuse me, if you read 1 Samuel, like I've asked you to, you'll find the story of David's life, and many of you know this. Um, he was a shepherd boy, right? Samuel the priest comes, goes around, looks at all of his brothers, like he's auditioning for The Bachelor. No, 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 you, I'll take you. Pours a bucket of oil over his head, says you're going to be the next king of Israel. What he essentially does is takes this ticket, tells David, you're going to be the king of Israel one day. Here's the ticket in your pocket. You got it. David goes on with his life, defeats Goliath, right? Catches King Saul's favor, who, by the way, King Saul was chosen by God to be there. Okay, so David's now got favor with the king. The king gives him an unpaid internship in the palace. How many know about them unpaid internships? You pretty much do whatever they tell you. Saul starts to find out all the things that David's good at. He's like, oh, you can sing? Okay, come sing. Oh, you can fight? Okay, go fight. You can, oh, you can do this, you can do that. And that's kind of what internships are about, just a heads up. Um, and then King Saul starts to get jealous of David, like this kid. I mean, it's weird, right? This grown man, like, jealous? Come on, dude. And the Bible talks about this many times where David would be playing his harp, you know, just hitting that Ed Sheeran over and over for Saul. And Saul just gives this righteous anger, just rises up in him, and he grabs the spear, and he just throws it right at David. And David's like, whoa, whoa. And the crazy thing is that this happened multiple times. Like, how many times does someone need to throw a spear at your head before you're like, hey, I think I need to find another opportunity at another organization? Like, this kept going on until finally David took off. And now Saul launches a manhunt to find him and to kill him. And in chapter 24, we just read David's hiding in a cave. He's hiding. And out of all of the bushes, the trees, the boulders, the mountains, Saul chooses this cave to go handle his business, to go relieve himself. Nature was calling. Do you understand what I'm saying? He had to go. Out of all the places that he could have gone, he chooses the same place that David is hiding. I mean, there is nothing more vulnerable than having to use the bathroom. Saul walks into the cave, pulls down his undies, pops a squat, whatever you guys do, and there it is. He's at David's mercy. This is, per this is a perfect setup because there is nothing more vulnerable then using the bathroom, I mean, why does the Postmates man always got to knock right when I sit down? I mean, why do my kids always need something right when I sit down? There's nothing I can do. I'm, you are rendered helpless. <laughs> if there's a fire in your dorm and you just sat down, I mean, it is vulnerable. There's nothing you can do. It's the worst position to be in. So there he is. David, you found the guy who's after your life in his most vulnerable position. It's perfect. What would you do? What would you do? If this guy sees you, he's going to kill you, and now you've caught him. He's at your mercy. What are you going to do? You're innocent, he's guilty. He's a terrorist. He wants to kill you. He's after your life. And you just caught him in his most vulnerable position. What are you going to do? 
what would you do? And this is the moment that I've been wrestling in. You see, the greatest successes in your life are usually a culmination of a lot of good decisions, small decisions over a period of time. But sometimes you can trace the shift in the trajectory of your life back to a single moment. And this is that moment. This is that moment for David. It's not the moment that Saul anointed him king or that Samuel anointed him king. It wasn't the moment that he defeated Goliath. It was actually this moment in obscurity, hiding in a cave at his rock bottom with death at breathing distance. What did he do? You see, at this point, David's boys are like, yo, this is it. Mind blown, I can't believe it, David. Take your shot. Hold him accountable. They even go as far as to say, God has placed Saul at your mercy. To me, that sounds a lot like, man, if God didn't want you to kill him, then why did he bring him in here? Sounds a lot like, if God didn't want you to stand that full, then why he in your DMs? If God didn't want you to eat that donut, then why did he bring it here? If God didn't want you to eat from that tree, why is it in the garden? You see that inner circle? How many know who your inner circle is? I love my inner circle. They are your biggest cheerleaders. They are your day ones. They are your ride or dies. They have your back. They will take a bullet for you. But they are not always right. And not everything is as it seems. The Bible calls the heart deceitful. It tells us not to lean not on our own understanding. What might seem right in man's eyes, God may call evil. So what do we do? How do we do this? How do we decide between what's right and what's wrong? We've got to invite the Holy Spirit. We've got to invite the Holy Spirit. We've got to invite God to show his truth to us. Give us the gift of discernment. We need the truth of the gospel to anchor us. Anchor us in truth. Because we too have plucked an apple from a tree in the garden. A tree called the knowledge of good and evil, a tree that you and I call social media and the internet. And our eyes have been opened, and our minds have been awakened to all of the things that we've ever wanted to know and ever wanted to see, but to also all the things we never needed to know and never needed to see. To things that do not serve our health, things that do not serve our mental well-being, things that do not serve our mission and our call for God, things that do not serve our peace, things that do not serve us well. Things that crawl right underneath our skin and wreck our peace and wreck our focus at its core. Things that disanchor us from truth. Amen? And yet we partake and we partake and we partake and we scroll and we scroll and we scroll and we swipe and we swipe and we swipe and we become accustomed and comfortable with this present reality, honoring its rules and its cultural norms and forgetting that there is still a truth that supersedes all reality. Not my truth. Not your truth, not your truth, but a supreme truth. A supreme truth that supersedes everything that we see. And we need God to show us that. We find safety in our facts, in our articles, in our data, in seeing and knowing. And that is so counterintuitive to faith. When did God's word 
point blank become not enough for us. Stop being enough for us. For example, he said, let there be light. Do we go to bed every night praying and hoping, Lord, please, please bring back the sun tomorrow. Please bring back the sun tomorrow, Lord. No. But when it comes to justice and reconciliation, and sometimes even the work of the cross, we think that we got to take it into our own hands. We like to decide how revenge gets handled, who gets forgiven, who passes the morality test, who should be canceled, as if somehow we are qualified to know. As somehow we have fully accomplished good at God's standards. I read a quote that said, the reason we have a hard time with God's acceptance of sinners is because we think he accepts us because we're good. Let me say that one more time. The reason we have a hard time with God's acceptance of sinners is because we think he accepts us because we're good. David only knew a reality of an abusive sociopathic leader. But he also had a truth, remember? Remember his truth? A ticket in his pocket, a truth that he could rely on because God spoke it. God said, you be king. So if I'm going to be king, then how is that possible when Saul's right here about to kill me? He's seconds away from taking my life. Is this still true, God? He's about to destroy me. Would you still believe God? With death breathing down your neck? Do you still believe God? With all of the things happening all around you right now. So who does David trust, huh? The reality that's standing right before his very eyes. He sees it in the flesh. It's there. It's happening. Or the truth. The word that God spoke to be. See, we have found ourselves held captive, friends, by words that God did not speak over us. You have been held captive by words that God did not speak over you. From real, real wounds, real pain, real trauma that you might have never experienced in this way had we clothed ourselves in truth. Truth says that God loves justice and vengeance is his. Truth says that those who plant injustice will harvest disaster and the reign of terror will come to an end. Truth says the wicked shall perish, but the godly shall stand. Truth says that no harm overtakes the righteous, but the wicked will have their fill of trouble. trouble. Truth says that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Is this the truth? Is this the truth? Period. Are the things that I read, are they the truth? Seven days a week. 365 days a year, because if that's the truth, that changes everything. It changes everything. And it is critical, vital, crucial, a matter of life and death that we approach the purpose that God has ordained our lives with strap, filled, covered, battered, marinated, stuffed with his undeniable, undefeated, unrivaled truth day after day after day because this is what happens next. Watch. David creeps up behind Saul. Hearing from his friends, he cuts off the edge of Saul's robe. And as soon as he does it, he feels a deep remorse come over him. Sometimes when you pause to listen to the Holy Spirit, they might call you weak. They might call you scared. They might tell you you punked out. They might call you a failure. They might challenge your purpose or your position or your authority or your influence. 
because they don't know that you got a ticket in your pocket. They don't know that God already anointed, ordained, and called you a long time ago. Not everything is as it seems. We have the privilege of foresight in the Bible, right? We can read ahead a few chapters and we can find out that Saul committed suicide. No one had Saul's blood on their hands. No one was responsible for the ending of Saul's reign except Saul. That to me is justice served sweet on ice. But David had no idea that this would be the case. In fact, if you flip over to Psalm chapter 57 and 58, you can actually read the heaviness that he was carrying. Those two uh, books, those two chapters of of the book of Psalms were written during this time. You see, I don't know, I didn't have anybody running after my life. But they mess with me, yo. They mess with me. They told me I was too much, I was too this, I was too that. They told me my eyes were aggressive, my body was assertive. Told me my face was this, that. They used the phrase, people have been saying. Don't you love that one? They referred to me as a hot-headed Latina. While I sat there speechless, motionless, trying not, my hardest not to move a muscle for fear of giving more ammunition. I was asked to comply with some demands and without hesitation I said yes. And then I was told that my yes wasn't convincing. It wasn't good enough. And it didn't make them feel good enough about me. Where are my Enneagram 8's at? You getting fired up? Feeling some little... a little smoke coming up in some certain corners of the room. You see, I had the same decision to make as David with the events that took place because one could say that I was hiding in a cave and found that Saul was at my mercy. Why? Because today we don't drag people outside the town walls and stone them to death. No. All we got to do is take a really juicy offense, post, tag, sit back, and watch entire kingdoms burn down. Am I right? Am I right? Will anybody in here be honest with me and tell me? Am I right? (laughs) Watch out for that guy. So I had a decision to make. And that kind of power is terrifying. Terrifying. Now, if you're like me, you're listening to to David's story with a little bit of disappointment. You mean what? He didn't kill him? I mean, I like to win. I love to win. But even more than winning, I hate losing. And this was a flagrant foul in your face, overt, out in the open, injustice taking place to David. And David not only has the nerve to not kill Saul when he has a chance, but this fool has the audacity to run after him and say, Saul, my king, why do you seek to kill me? See this piece of your robe that I cut off? God put you at, your mer- at my mercy, but I won't touch you. You're still going to call him your king? See, no. I, I mean, I'm a Christian, but I mean, I'm not like that Christian. <laughs> like, this ain't right. This, ain't, this is humiliating. This is not, this is not good. And there's no doubt in my mind that God would have understood, David, why you had to kill his king. I think God would have understood. He's unfit. He's got an attitude. He's dangerous. He shouldn't be trusted with that much influence. Do you think that we're telling God something that he doesn't already know? 
Do you think we're educating our Lord on some brand new knowledge that he's not aware of? We have perfected the art of weaponizing our offenses. The offense itself has somehow become more powerful than the offender. It's like a sword in David's hands. So a year ago, didn't I tell you guys that I got my receipts? I got my receipts. You think I've never captured videos of offenses taking place before? You think I had never been one of those people that pulled out my phone and like, ooh, that would be really good on TMZ. You think I don't have that kind of stuff here? Well, why you have those nests, you up here preaching to us. How you have videos like that? Because hello, I at least gotta show my husband I said I was saved, but I'm still working on the sanctification, okay? Let's keep it real. But can I admit to you today that every time that I have captured an offense on camera, every time that I slice the hem of, of Saul's garment, flirting with retaliation, that I immediately felt remorse? But Ness, you didn't kill him, right? You didn't post it online, right? No, you're right. I, I, I did not destroy anyone's career, anyone's reputation. But every single time I have felt God say, don't try to do my job. Ugh. You suck at my job. He said, Vanessa, when he uses my full name, it's serious. Vanessa, there is a huge difference between justice and retaliation. What do you mean, God? And God said, you want to hop online right now and tell the world what happened so the world can come to your rescue. And yet you have the nerve to call me your savior. So what's the difference? You see, retaliation is fueled by emotions, and justice is fueled by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Retaliation is a weapon used only to kill, steal, and destroy, but justice is a weapon used to bring freedom and deliverance. Retaliation is blinded by rage and fury, but justice is conscious, tactical, strategic, and wise. Retaliation's goal, only goal, is to get even. But the goal of justice is reconciliation. Retaliation is going to cost you. It could even cost you your ticket, as we see with Saul. But justice was already paid for. It's free. Listen, Jesus loves justice. Jesus loves justice more than you do. And with that truth planted firmly in my heart, I no longer feel the need to engage or to lower myself into acts of retaliation or revenge or vengeance. No, I can still fight for justice, but I do so via Jesus. Not for Jesus, not on behalf of Jesus, because the truth is he doesn't need my help with justice. He will pay back evil for, for its sins. He will pay us back, each and every one of us. The Bible says that we will be held accountable for every, every idle word that we speak, among other things, right? Do you think God needs our help? Listen, before I go any further, I need to to pause here and to make it very loud and clear that I am not making a case for abusers to run free. If you have found yourself the receiving end of real abuse, trauma, gaslighting, get help, ASAP, don't wait another minute and don't even worry about what might happen to them, to their family. Don't wait for a second. I want to be clear that I'm referring to 
the collective cultural trend that seeks to weaponize offenses for the sole purpose of destruction. And that is totally different than someone trying to get their life back from an abuser. So please hear me on that. PJ, you can come help me now. Listen, you're called, you're anointed, you got a ticket in your pocket called the truth, the purpose and the plan that God has for you. You have the undefeated gospel, access to it. And now we got to walk forth in this crazy world ready because Friends, your calling is revealed in the secret. It's developed in the trials. It's tested during the blatant injustice, the unfair things. But it's proven. It is proven when an undeserving Paul, I mean Saul, is at your mercy. What's your next move? What is your next move? Who are you? Who are you, baby boy? Who are you, baby girl? When Saul is at your mercy. Listen, I got one last lesson that I couldn't learn right away. You see, it took some time. I had to step away. I had to get out of the heat of that moment. And I don't even know what possessed me to not act immediately because sometimes, you know, we do things so irrationally, but I paused. And here's the hidden story, the hidden beauty of my situation. I was in the wrong seat anyway. I was running in the wrong lane to begin with. I didn't belong there. And I have a few friends here today that could probably testify. In a sense, I was hiding in a cave. And somehow God used Saul's need to take a dump to, in my space to pluck me out of that cave and to take up my call. Sometimes what happens to us feels very raw, very fresh, not right. And we want to march, we want to activate, and we want to gather, and we want to protest. And sometimes that might be the right thing to do. But other times, God might be saying, And I would guess that there's a few of you today that can look back to some things that have happened in your life and you can see the way God used that horrible thing to make you the amazing man or the amazing woman that you are today. He told us in this life we would have troubles. It doesn't seem like fun, but he doesn't waste those troubles. He doesn't waste a thing. You see, because even after hearing these horrible things spoken out over me, I had to decide. This is a horrible reality, God, but your truth about me says something else. Now I can choose to set up camp and to partner with that reality. 
or I can choose to partner with truth. Listen, we're gonna end here today, but I just wanna pray over you and I'll be available to, to chat if you feel compelled to do so. But we're living in tough times. And it's sometimes hard to know when is it time to charge forth, when is it time to pause. We need this. We need the truth. Let's pray. God, would you stand with me? Wherever you are, just stand in this place. Lord, would you just fill this room right now, God, with a wisdom that surpasses all understanding, Lord. You're softening hearts all over this place, Lord. You're giving us back a hunger for your presence, for your Holy Spirit, for your truth, God, where we have places and times where we can think back where we've trusted our emotions instead of trusting your truth, where we have looked at the waves, where we have looked at the reality of our situation, where we have looked at, at times where death was at our doorstep and, and, and we had believed it rather than believing what you've said about us, Lord. And I believe that you're opening hearts in this room, Lord. showing your people, Lord, that you care about what they care about. You've seen the unfair things that have taken place. They have not gone unnoticed to you, Lord. Give us peace in that today, Lord. Give us peace in knowing, God, that you have not forgotten us. You see, you see it all, Jesus. You see it all. You see it all. I just sense that there's some wrestling and maybe some forgiveness in people that don't deserve your forgiveness. And that's kind of where the wrestling is coming from. Or not, maybe not even people, but situations, circumstances that you've been in and the wrestling is because it's so undeserving of your forgiveness. And I see God with his hands out saying, will you let me take over that for you? Will you let me be your advocator? Will you let me be the one who pursues justice on your behalf? Will you trade retaliation for my justice? Will you trade revenge for my justice? Because I do such a good job at it. God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for this time with these amazing students. And thank you for this generation of world changers, God, that you are bringing up right before our very eyes. Love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.